It's a dreary, chilly November morning in Seichan, Indiana. As I pull up to this corner and see this church, I'm feeling pretty excited because I get to go in there and look around. And ultimately, I'm going to end up here. I hope you stick around with me and we'll go exploring together. This is the old St. John the Evangelist Church. This church was used from 1925 until 2008 when a new church was constructed. Thankfully, they have decided to leave it stand and it's still utilized for weddings and funerals and daily mass for the school. The territory of Indiana wasn't organized by the U.S. government until 1800, and it wasn't admitted as a state until December of 1816. At that time, the entire northwest part of the state was nothing but wilderness. In 1832, after a peace treaty with the Indians, the U.S. purchased this area of Indiana from them. Government surveyors arrived in 1834, and it's generally agreed that the town had its beginning when a German immigrant by the name of John Hack arrived in 1837. The area back then, before it was called St. John, was known as Prairie West. St. John was a typical frontier town. Agriculture was a mainstay. General stores were opened, selling clothing, tools, seed. There were tailors, blacksmiths, markets. And remember that John Hack guy? After a few years of farming, he decided to open a peach brandy distillery, which is probably one of the first businesses in town. Thanks for staying with me during that quick history lesson. Now back to the church. The cornerstone of this church was laid in 1923, but it wasn't finished and dedicated until September 27, 1925, by Bishop F. Knoll, who was the Bishop of the Diocese of Fort Wayne at the time. He was born in 1875, and he passed away in 1956 at the age of 81. This is a picture of how he probably looked at the time of the dedication of this church. And if that name rings a bell to some of you, there's a local high school that was built back in 1921. It was known as Catholic Central, and it was later renamed Bishop Knoll in 1947 in his honor. Now, I have been in this church before. I've attended Mass here. I've been to a funeral here. But I've never come to this church and actually looked around in the capacity that I am today. As I look at it in better detail, I'm really struck at how beautiful it actually is. Even with the computers and the technology and the machinery that we have today, could we still replicate this kind of beauty? I'm not sure we could. I wonder what I'm going to find behind that door. Hey, this reminds me of grade school. It's about the same time frame, too. Some of this stuff's been up here for quite a while. This is exactly what I had hoped for. As I climbed this ladder that was built almost 100 years ago, and I looked to my left at the brickwork and to my right at the steelwork, I can't help but think of the men 
who constructed this church, what their stories were, where they came from, and the gifts of their craftsmanship and their labor that they shared with this faith community has been able to worship here for almost 100 years. thousands upon thousands of large lag bolts that were driven in by hand with no power tools. Coming out of the darkness of the attic into the light of the bell tower, I'm eagerly anticipating what I'm about to see. I'm amazed at these bells. They're much larger than I thought they were going to be, and they appear pretty old. The bells, or at least the cradle that they're sitting on, were made by a company called F.A. Gench in Chicago, Illinois. I wasn't able to find out anything about the company, but I was able to find out about Mr. Gench. He was a partner in a law firm called Gench & Meyer, and apparently they also worked as bell founders in the mid-1850s. By 1860, though, they decided to use their skill set and make campaign medals for the 1860 election, featuring none other than Abraham Lincoln. So the men who forged these bells, or at least the cradle that they are sitting on, also had a hand in electing the 16th president of the United States of America. Now, did anybody just see what I just saw? I'm seeing Evangelista on this bell, which leads me to believe that this was made for St. John the Evangelist. But look at the date, 1865. And as I pan over to the other bell, 1867. Now, this church was made in 1925. These bells are from 60 years earlier, during the Civil War time. These are from a different church. In honorum Sancti Josephi. In honor of Saint Joseph. So this bell was made for Saint Joseph, and it wasn't made in Chicago, it was made in St. Louis, Missouri, by a completely different foundry. Pio IX, Pope Pius IX, whose pontificate was from 1846 to 1878. Fits the time frame. The one bit of information I was able to find out about the Gench Company was this advertising medallion that they made. They were located at 105 South Well Street, which is in Old Town, the oldest part of the city. It's an address that doesn't exist anymore. Bells made to order from 1 to 50,000 pounds, and they were founded, it appears, in 1857. So one pound all the way up to 25 tons. These guys were able to make some large bells. There was one other photo that I found with an article that said that this bell that was on display at the World's Fair in 1893, Jackson Park, Chicago, the Columbian Exposition, that this bell might have been founded by the Gents Company with four Chicago police officers standing guard.
in my research, I was able to find out that this was actually the fourth church that has been built for this congregation. The one prior was started in 1851 and dedicated on October 20th of 1856. I was unable to find any photos of it. The prior two churches were log cabins. And although I was unable to find any information or photographs about the prior church to this, guess which church I was able to find information about? Not only information, but the church itself. It still exists. And it's a couple hundred feet away. This is the original church of this congregation, built by John Hack in 1837. It's currently being used as a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel. These 186-year-old hand-hewn beams represent the very beginning of faith and worship in Lake County, Indiana. This was the first church. Walking back, I couldn't help but think about the people who were the original founders of this church, the hardships that they must have faced, the uncertainty they must have faced, and the work that must have gone into creating something out of nothing. I've known about this very small cemetery that exists for a number of years. It's off to the side of the road, and if you blink your eyes, you'll miss it. I decided to stop and look, and guess whose name showed up again? It's obviously a very old cemetery, and most of the headstones are illegible. Notice the small details of 19th century craftsmanship. We're standing on the grounds of the original church right now and also the presumed location of the grave of Mr. Hack, although I can't seem to find it. I am able to locate a headstone with the name Hack on it in the cemetery from 1854. This is really the only headstone in the cemetery that you can read. The rest are too weathered. Just as I'm getting ready to give up and leave, I notice writing on the back side of one of the large monuments in the cemetery. I had initially walked right past it because I didn't see anything on the other sides of it. This is the final resting place of Mr. John Hack. He was born in Germany in 1788, and he died here in St. John, Indiana in November of 1856 at the age of 68. As John Hack began his voyage across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe, there's no way he could have possibly imagined what he was about to begin, what he was about to found, along with the work of hundreds of others from the humble beginnings of a one-room log cabin to the beautiful church which St. John the Evangelist calls home today. This is the story of one small community's faith. I think it's important to remember that we all come from these humble beginnings in this country. I think it's also very important to remember the people that laid the groundwork for the lives that we live these days. Our history, our legacy, our lineage, it's all around us. You can find it. 
sometimes all you have to do is look up.